It's a rainy day, so we're going to be making a really simple and easy tea with a lot of medicinal benefits. We're going to be using cedar leaves to make cedar tea. Now, cedar can mean a lot of different things depending on where you live, but generally cedar that I'm referring to in this instance is referring to trees within the Thuya family which includes both western red cedar as well as white cedar. But there are also a whole other genus of trees called juniperus, which are junipers, but are often also referred to as cedars. So you can actually use either one of those trees to make a tea, um, including a lot of other conifer trees, pine needles, um, firs, spruces, lots of conifers that you can use to make tea. For this, we're using cedar. I'll give you guys a close up on what our cedar looks like. Our cedar is this flat planed needled branch. And you may have been familiar with cedar flavor if you've ever heard of cedar planked salmon, which is actually using the wood of the cedar to cook fish on but you can get that same cedar flavor without having to cut down the whole tree. And so this is very easily harvestable by anyone and it is super high in vitamin C. So what we're going to do is actually just add these to a big pot of water and we're going to let it simmer on the stove for about 30 minutes. And that's going to let it infuse all of that yummy cedar flavor into our water and make tea. And we'll note a couple of things from this. Cedar is, as I mentioned, very high in vitamin C, but it has a slightly bitter flavor if you harvest the older branches. So I like to harvest the new growth of the cedar. You can see this by looking at the stem. This green part here is the new growth on the end of the branches. And this part here that has developed its bark is the older growth. This part, the new part, will have a better flavor, be less bitter, but the part back here will have more vitamin C in it. So slightly more medicinal quality if that's what you're looking for. So great thing to know when harvesting cedar. Uh, obviously, if you're harvesting in an area that has a lot of cedar trees. You really don't have to be too cautious about over harvesting, but you do want to make sure that you're only taking a little bit from each tree. So maybe a branch from each tree, depending on the size of the branch. And you wanna make sure that you're not picking from any trees that are shorter than six feet tall. Uh, you wanna make sure that that tree has had some time to mature and that you're able to harvest from it without hurting the tree and its ability to feed itself by transforming sunlight and water into energy. So we are going to break this up into slightly smaller pieces so that it can fit into the pot. Um, I will also say when you're harvesting cedar, bring a nice pair of scissors because that makes it easier to harvest branches. Or um, if you're with someone that is qualified and super safe, a knife may work depending on where you're at. And always harvest branches above waist high. That's to make sure that no animals have uh, peed on the cedar. Uh, that's really important. But also you want to make sure that you're harvesting away from roadways or train tracks or other places where there's a lot of pollution. So obviously because we're putting something that was on a tree right into the water, um, you don't want all of those pollutants that come out of exhaust fumes to be deposited on that branch because that branch is going right into the water and anything that's on that branch is going to get deposited into the water too. So you don't want tea that's made of exhaust fumes. Um, I will rinse this off a little bit just to make sure that I'm getting any yucky stuff off of here. Um, even if it's a spider web or something, I'm just gonna rinse it off.
And then I'm going to put this right into the water on my stove. So I have a big kettle of water here and the cedar is in it and I'm just going to let that simmer. Cedar is really amazing, obviously not just because we can drink it as a delicious tea, but tribes traditionally along the Pacific coast, all the way from coastal Oregon up into Alaska, have traditionally used all parts of the cedar for various uses. Cedar bark can be woven into hats, clothing, mats. Um, cedar planks can be made and used to build homes from. Uh, cedar roots can be woven into baskets as well. Incredible, incredible plant, and there's so many uses for it. Cedar is also naturally rot resistant, which means that it's not going to break down as fast as some other types of woods, which makes it great for building houses or applications where it may get wet a lot. That's really, really important. And for a lot of people, cedar is also a really important um, sacred medicine. So another use of cedar is for smudging and for using cedar in that way as well. It is incredibly important. Um, it is naturally insect repellent. So some people will make raised beds in their garden out of cedar because it has that really, really great smell that actually repels pest insects that may eat their plants. Similarly, people actually have used cedar to make wooden chests where they hold clothing and stuff inside, which means that moths don't get to their clothes and don't eat their clothes. So again, amazing plant and so many uses. I'm super excited to show this recipe to you guys because it is really easy and it's amazingly delicious. You can pair it with anything. You even don't have to cook it if you don't have the ability to at the moment. So I am going to be demonstrating for you guys sunflower maple cookies. There are a few variations of ways to make sunflower maple cookies. I'm going to show you my favorite way and let you guys adapt it how you see fit and how you like to eat it. So the only ingredients that we're going to need for this are raw sunflower seeds without their shells maple syrup, and a little bit of salt. Super simple. Um, if you can only find roasted sunflower seeds, I would recommend not using them. They just don't stick together as well and they don't have the same texture that we need. Um, you also wanna make sure that you're using real maple syrup, not the corn syrup with maple flavoring added. We really want to highlight the indigenous flavors of this dish. So sunflowers are obviously a great example of indigenous agricultural wisdom. Sunflowers were bred very intentionally by native people over generations to have large edible seeds and in some places are often referred to as the fourth sister. The three sisters being corn, beans, and squash and sunflowers sometimes being planted alongside them as a border crop. Um, that's because sunflowers have a chemical that they actually release through their roots, which kind of inhibits the growth of other plant species. There are a few plant species that can resist it, but sunflowers for the most part try to eliminate competitors by making sure that they are the only plant in that area, which makes them great for borders because they prevent weeds from coming into the rest of the garden and they really secure that boundary from pests. They're also obviously a great windbreak plant. They offer some shade protection and they're beautiful. They attract pollinators, which the rest of the garden needs. So really important things about sunflowers and a wonderful example of indigenous agricultural wisdom. Maple syrup is another brilliant example of indigenous foods. Maple syrup obviously comes from maple trees, which native people in the Great Lakes region learned to tap, which involves putting a tap into the tree in the early springtime when you're getting those freezing temperatures at night and thawing during the day. And that sap flows down into baskets or buckets where it is gathered. And then 
through a process of either boiling or freezing that is gradually concentrated farther and farther and farther down until you get just the sugary part of that sap rather than the sap with all the water in it. Uh, a lot of the times this was actually made into sugar which means it was heated to a higher temperature than syrup is required for and that process actually crystallizes the sugar molecules within the syrup and it's a liquid at a very hot temperature but then it is poured into sugar molds so that you can have candy in cute shapes or you can take birch bark and it was wrapped into cones with a little string tie and that was poured into the birch bark cones it was left to cool and then they could be stored upside down and that was a way of keeping a lot of maple sugar stored without having to worry about animals getting to it and still having a really packable cone for trading with other nations or for long-term storage so really cool things when it came to maple syrup i'll put up a video for you guys to see the process of maple sugaring the traditional way um, but just know it is amazing indigenous brilliance that led us to have syrup um, there are other trees that can be tapped to get syrup but of course sugar maple has the highest concentration of sugar in a certain amount of sap which means that if you take birch and you tapped birch to make syrup if you tapped a hickory or walnut or box elder these other plants these other trees that can be tapped for sap uh, you have to get a lot more sap to equal the same amount of syrup that you can get from sugar maple just based on the ratios of sugar to water in that sap so what we're going to do is adjust this camera angle slightly so you guys are able to see what this process is going to look like um, the other ingredient we're going to need is actually just some salt so i just have some regular table salt here I'm going to add that to my cookie dough to enable me to have a really nice, it'll bring out the sweetness, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to adjust the angle on this so that you guys can see what's going on and we'll get to cookie making. So here's what we have. You guys can see my workstation set up now. So I have a bowl with my sunflower seeds and I'm actually going to need to grind these sunflower seeds into a flour. Now, you can do that in a number of different ways. If you have a mortar and pestle, you can use that to manually press these. You could put these in a Ziploc bag and crunch them with the bottom of a mug or something like that. Or my favorite method, which you guys get to see, is actually using an old coffee grinder that has had the coffee cleaned out of it. But instead, what we're going to do is use this to pour our seeds into and we're going to grind this we're going to grind this in little bits so cover your ears for a second and I'm actually going to get another bowl to pour the flour into Some of my flour sticks to the sides of this so I can get more out if I shake it up a little bit. And I'm just going to keep adding some more sunflower seeds into here. You want to be careful you don't grind them too much because if you grind them too much they'll turn into sunflower butter which is kind of like peanut butter, only it's made of sunflowers. You're just trying to get them into the consistency of almost cornmeal texture, a little bit finer, fine cornmeal texture. And we're just gonna keep grinding this in batches. We're 
almost done with this. I'm trying not to pack this thing too full. You could also take that a spatula or even a knife and just clean that out right at the end is what I'm gonna do. And all right, that is the end of my sunflower seeds. Just gotta grind this last batch. clean this out at the end and set that off to the side right now. So now this next part is going to get a little dirty. So I'm going to wash my hands, roll up my sleeves, and we're going to make cookies. So I'm going to sprinkle in about a teaspoon of, well, about a half a teaspoon of salt to all these sunflower seeds. I will post the exact proportions that I'm using down in the captions right here. All right, so I have a quarter cup of maple syrup measured out. But I'm just going to add this slowly and I'm going to mix it with my hands because I'm only trying to add enough so that it will stick together, but it won't be sticky from all the syrup. So we want it to stick together so that we have nice little cookies, but not be sticky. So I'm going to add about half of this to get us started. And then I get to get my hands dirty. Depending on how finely you ground your sunflower flour, you may have a different consistency. And so it may need more or less syrup. It's a little bit hard to measure just by measuring. You have to really get a feel for what the consistency of the dough is. This seems like it's starting to stick together pretty well. I'm still trying to mix everything really evenly and get all the really wet pieces off of my fingers. Okay, so this is getting to be really nice. So I don't even think I'm gonna need the rest of that. I think I have nice little cookie balls that will stick together. So I am going to try to make these into basically tiny hamburger patties. So I want them to look like this and to be nicely compacted so they really stick together well. And then I'm going to squeeze them and try to use my thumb to round them out so that they're a nice compact shape. And I'm just gonna place them on my plate here. So obviously because the ingredients are just sunflower seeds and maple syrup and salt, you don't have to cook these. These can be no-bake cookies if that's what you want. Or we can pan fry them, which is where we just put them on a pan with a little bit of oil until they're browned on both sides. And then you have a nice little crispy golden brown cookie. 
If you want to get really fancy, you can even put some berries on top, or you can dress them up a little bit. You could take some maple sugar, you could sprinkle it on top. That cookie kind of fell apart a little bit. Plus my hands are sticky, so that didn't help. So obviously you can scale this recipe depending on how many cookies you want. I'm just going to, I think I'll probably have about six cookies, maybe seven cookies out of all of this. And again, that may get bigger or smaller depending on how big you make your cookies. My last cookie is going to be pretty small. The nice thing about this is if you pan fry them, they can be different sizes. If you make cookies in the oven, you kind of want to make sure that they're all the same size because you're cooking them all at one time. If you're cooking them in a pan on the stove top, it's a little bit easier because you get to watch them all individually. But you have to be really careful to make sure that you're watching them. This one's a little tiny one. I'm going to put that right in the middle. All my cookies kind of look like a sunflower together. Now my hands are super dirty, so I'm going to wash them off in the sink, and then I'm going to come back and show you guys how to cook these on the stove in a pan. So we're looking at the stove right now, and we're actually going to put a little bit of oil into this pan so it starts to heat up. I don't want a lot of oil, but just enough that it's going to help distribute the heat and crisp up my cookies. This is avocado oil, so it has a really high smoke point, which just means that it's not going to start smoking or burning on the cookies when we're cooking these. So I have my temperature turned to about medium heat, because we want this oil to heat up. These cookies are not gonna take very long to cook when we actually get them cooked, but we need to be really careful to watch them. I'm also using avocado oil because it's a nice, healthy, indigenous oil, and it has good fats in it, which makes it a really great for using for this purpose. If you wanted to use another plant that you've already used in this recipe, you could use sunflower oil which is another indigenous oil, or if you have a safflower oil or a corn oil, corn oil is another indigenous oil, obviously, um, but even a light olive oil would work. You just need something to help you hold a little bit of heat in the pan. So I'm going to start by putting a couple of these cookies into the oil and spreading them out. So I wanna make sure that they get oil on them, but they don't need to be sitting in the oil. I guess my pan's a little uneven, all the oil's pooling at one side. So I'm gonna actually cook those over there. It looks like a weird four-eyed smiley face with this and that. But I'm just going to let these cook. This is also an important part of making sure that you're using raw sunflower seeds because this part is actually toasting or roasting those sunflower seeds. So this process itself is actually going to bring out the flavor of those seeds without ever having the pre-toasted ones. If you roast things that are already roasted, it just doesn't come out quite like you want it to. So now you can see I have a beautiful golden brown cookie that didn't take very long at all means I need to watch my other ones so that they're not going to crisp up. Just dumped that in the oil. This is the really important part of making sure that you're watching these. So those are beautiful. Okay, that one's brown on the other side. That one's brown on the other side. That one's brown. 
I'm going to put this cookie in. This doesn't take very long at all, so I have to be really careful and watch them. This is my last cookie going in. And we're just crisping these up. I'm going to turn my heat down a little bit. Again, I want them to be golden brown, but not burnt. That one's a little light, but that's not too bad. Oof. I have to be really gentle with these. You can use a spatula if that's something you're more comfortable with. I use this so I don't splash any oil. And these are super close to being done. That one's done, that one's done, and our final cookie is done. Our cedar tea has been brewing for about 30 minutes, so I'm going to grab a ladle and scoop out some. I'm actually gonna put it in this glass just so you guys can see how pretty it is, but normally I would say put it in a mug, drink it like a cozy cup of tea. So I have a really beautiful cup of cedar tea right here, and this tea is delicious by itself, or if you want, you can add a little bit of maple syrup, so you can just drizzle a little bit to your liking into your cup of tea, and then you have a really cozy tea to warm you up on a rainy day, or you can ice it. And iced cedar tea is incredibly refreshing in the summertime on a hot day. Cedar almost has like a subtle type of citrus undertones, if that's maybe the best way to describe it. Um, so the iced version has this really refreshing quality. So I also love pairing cedar tea with some maple sunflower cookies and that makes the perfect afternoon cozy snack or just a lovely protein packed meal to, I wouldn't call it, maybe not a meal, but a lovely snack to sit down and enjoy after dinner. So maple cedar tea and sunflower maple cookies.